Hey, what's up everybody? We want to welcome you to another episode of the Dreamers Pro Daily Recap, where we give you a recap of all of the hot topics that we covered that day. You can catch them in their long format and also catch it fully streaming for free on Apple Podcasts. For the people that are new to the channel, you may not know how I feel about Ben Simmons. Those have been, that have been here for quite some time, they know. But for the new people, let me just tell you guys where I stand with Ben Simmons. I think Ben Simmons is one of the biggest time wasters we have going in the NBA today. And I don't even think it's up for, uh, it's, uh, it's up for even debate. No one has wasted people's time more than one Ben Simmons. Let's just, let's just, let's just go back to the beginning. Prior to Ben Simmons uh, 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 coming into the NBA, he was being compared to LeBron James. People were saying that Ben Simmons could potentially be the next LeBron James. Why were they saying this? Because Ben Simmons was a six foot 10 point forward that could run a break. He was very fast. Uh, he was quick. He was strong. He had impeccable court vision. And to be fair, he was a better defender than LeBron James, not the score. But given all of his physical attributes, coupled with his basketball IQ, a lot of people felt that Ben Simmons was, you know, going to be on his way to becoming, you know, probably a Hall of Famer, certainly a multiple time All-Star going into the future. His first season in the NBA as a rookie, rookie in 2017, his stat line was the following, 15.8 points, although, yeah, 15.8 points uh, on 54.5% shooting from the field with 56% shooting from the free throw line. Um, and I think he was getting you, what, eight rebounds and eight assists per game with 1.7 steals. The next season, he followed that up with 16.9. So you saw an improvement on 56% shooting from the field. You saw an improvement there as well. He shot 0% from the three, 60% from the free throw line. You saw an improvement there as well. And he got you 8.8 rebounds, which is an improvement, 7.7 assists, which is virtually more or less the same as a year prior, uh, and 1.4 steals per game. His third season in Philly, Ben Simmons was now scoring 16 a game on 58% shooting from the field. So his field goal shooting percentage had increased every single year he was in the NBA. He was shooting 28% from the three. So to go from zero to 28.6, that's an improvement. I think the vast majority of us would agree with that. His free throw shooting percentage went to 62. And his rebounds was about eight rebounds a game and eight assists per game. So Ben Simmons was basically a 16, uh, eight and eight guy, right? And that year, he that was his career high in steals per game. And what these statistics don't capture is obviously uh, his defensive contributions to a, to, 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 uh, to a team, right? But then after that, we started, he, Ben Simmons started to go on a decline, All right? Started to go on a decline. And that following season, his score went down. His field goal shooting percentage went down. His three-point shooting was the same, but it was, it was a negligible difference, 28.6 to 30%. Free throw shooting, 61%. But his rebounds went down and assists went down uh, and his steals went down. Uh, and that was his final year in Philly. They get to the playoffs. And we all know what Ben Simmons did. Passed open a wide open dunk layup. Passed it to a teammate who basically got mugged on his way to the rim. And everybody thought that that was basically the back breaking game. That just pretty much sealed the fate for the Philadelphia 76ers. And then Doc Rivers came out and made the infamous comments. He doesn't know if he can be the future going to the, the point guard going to the future. And then Joel Embiid said what he said. And then ever since then, that's when things went downhill for, in Philly. And then Ben Simmons took it upon himself to show the world just how big of a baby he can be. And he basically staged a mutiny. He refused to go to work, show up to work, and he said he wanted out. There were even reports of his teammates flying to California to go basically uh, 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 coax him to returning. He told him, I don't know why you guys wasted your money coming all the way out here. Just please about face and go all the way back. Y'all, I'm not changing my mind. And it got into this thing with, with Doc Rivers and Rich Paul where he was like, he needs to uh, honor his contract and all of these different things, right? Then what happens with this Ben Simmons? He goes to Brooklyn. Somehow he got traded, even though they later on found out he got an injury. He had an injury. I don't know. He passed that physical examination. He gets to Brooklyn, right? This Joker gets to Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Nets, where I think we're going to the playoffs. In the midst of the playoffs, we start hearing that Ben Simmons could come back. He could come back. There were even videos of him talking I mean, after practicing. I can come. I come back. Then 
out of nowhere, the Brooklyn Nets go down 0-3. And he's like, Ben Simmons has a back injury. We cannot see, we won't be seeing him anymore. That year in Brooklyn, he averaged, get this, a whopping 6.9 points per game on 56% shooting with 0% shooting from the three. 43.9% shooting from the free throw line with 6.3 rebounds and 6.1 assists and 1.3 steals. At that point, people started coming out and calling out Ben Simmons. And one of those people was Shaquille O'Neal. He was tough on Ben Simmons. But what happened recently, he did a sit down, I believe, with his son on a show by Complex called Goat Talk. And they were talking about various players. But then it got to the point where they were discussing ben simmons and when it came time for shaq to give his thoughts on ben simmons he absolutely molly whopped this dude uh, uh with his comments so these are the comments that we want to get into we're going to be reading from a yahoo sports article so let's 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 read what shaq had to say here so the article starts off with the headline saying shaq calls nets ben simmons a bum for not playing in more games brooklyn Nets guard ben simmons has been uh, has had quite a bout of bad uh, injury luck over the past few years to the point that him being on the floor is considered a, a point of progress for his career. While Simmons had been paid like a star player for the past few seasons, there are some who dislike that fact. In an interview with Miles O'Neal of Complex, NBA legend basketball Hall of Famer Shaquille O'Neal was quick, uh, uh, was asked to pick the worst NBA player of all time. While the former LSU Tiger went to nominate Minnesota Timberwolves center Rudy Gobert for the award, he also picked someone that was also went to his alma mater. Ben Simmons is another bum. If you sign a contract for $250 million, show me $250, O'Neal said while explaining why he picked Simmons for the distinction. Since uh, signing his five-year $177 million contract extension in July of 2019 with the Philadelphia 76ers. Simmons has made over $145 million on the court, but has played in just 175 games in five seasons. There is a reason why I walk funny, O'Neal said. When, why I can't turn my neck, why I can't do it, because I played uh, for my 120. So you guys, so you got guys like him that you know screw the system this isn't the first time that simmons has been criticized by o'neill for not playing in more games and certainly isn't the uh, the first time that simmons has been called out by a big media personality that's what shaq had to say he went far but i don't think he went far enough so i'm gonna go ahead and go a little bit further the the season that i outlined which was ben simmons's first season with the Brooklyn Nets, some people attributed that to injury. Then what happened? They were like, okay, Ben Simmons is going to, you know, get himself right, come back the next season, and he's going to show the whole world what he got. The following season, which is the 2023-2024 season, he played just 15 games. But in those 15 games, Ben Simmons was scoring a whopping 6.1 points per game. His scoring went down. His field goal shooting percentage went to 58. Some of you guys were like, well, this, this is a fantastic improvement. Well, here's the kicker in all of this. Ben Simmons in his rookie season was averaging 12.3 attempts, field goal attempts per game. Last season, Ben Simmons was averaging 4.9. Less than five shots a game. And he was making 2.9. So obviously, you're going to shoot a high percentage when you're very selective with the shots that you take. Once again, he shot 0% from the three-point line and get this he was only attempting one free throw attempt per game and he made 40 percent of his free throws i want to give you guys a statistic here you guys understand that we are currently in the nba that is now hyper focused on three-point shooting essentially if you even want to be on a basketball floor you need to be able to space the floor this goes for guards all the way up to stretch fours and centers in some cases in the case of Ben Simmons, not only has he shot, get this, in the six years he's been in the NBA, I want you to get you guys to hear this properly. In the six years Ben Simmons has been a professional NBA player, in the six years, Ben Simmons has shot 0%. Hear this well. 0% from the three-point line in four of the six years he's been an NBA player. Four of the six years this guy has called, had the privilege of calling himself an NBA player, he shot 0% from the three. 
I want to give you guys another an, an, another thought. In the six years that Ben Simmons has been in the NBA, do you know how many three-point shots Ben Simmons has made in six years? Ben Simmons in six NBA seasons has made five three-point shots. I'll repeat that. In six NBA seasons, this guy has made five three-pointers. Now, there's some people that will say, well, you know, he doesn't really need to shoot. All he needs to do is push the floor. I mean, push the ball up the court, set up his teammates, set picks, roll to the basket, play at the dunker spot, blah, 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 blah. Like I said, these people are the only one that understand basketball. When you're on the floor and you cannot space the floor, you are, you are, you are a liability. On offense, teams are going to be playing against four. It's going to be five on four. Or defense, five on four. Because you know there's one guy you don't need to pay attention to because he's not going to shoot. Hell, he's not even looking at the basket to shoot. And some people have guessed that the reason he's afraid to shoot is because he's afraid to get fouled. Because Ben Simmons has some psychological block. We can say that, okay, Ben Simmons has suffered some injuries. Therefore, he could he hasn't been able to improve. Fine. What about his free throw shooting percentage? How hasn't he been able to improve his free throw shooting percentage? The last two seasons, he's shooting 40 and 44% from the free throw. How do you attribute that to injuries? That's just a lack of repetition. You don't care. You don't care. But when it comes time to killing the gram, oh, Ben Simmons ain't nothing to play with. He like the goat of the gram. He can post his cars and all of that stuff. And he got the ladies buzzing. Oh, you seen what? You seen the new whip? You seen the crib? He can do that. But when it comes to actually focusing on basketball and improving, he has no interest in it. And all of his contemporaries have gone on to improve. And Ben Simmons is still the same old damn Ben Simmons. Um, Skip Bayless recently made his departure from FS1, right? He even went out there and made some comments publicly on his Twitter, basically thanking the network and, you know, describing what his experience was like, I believe, for what, eight years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at the network. And how he said he was then on to go doing on to doing bigger uh, and better things there. But when the news initially broke, a lot of us assumed that Skip Bayless was fired. Why did many of us assume this? based on the numbers that we were getting. So you guys remember after Shannon Sharp left the show, uh, uh, Undisputed decided to do a reshuffle. They started bringing in various uh, uh, um, media personalities like Keyshawn Johnson, Paul Pierce, uh, Rachel Nichols, um, um, uh, who else? Michael Irvin and a whole bunch of Richard Sherman and so many others. And a lot of people expected, or at least people within the, the corridors of Fox Sports, expected that to be just what the, you know, the doctor ordered. But instead, it ended up being an absolute disaster. Shannon Sharp went over to ESPN uh, first take and they started hitting record highs. And then Undisputed was hitting record lows. And they were hitting lows that were even lower than when Shannon Sharp was there. I mean, when Shannon Sharp was there, they were averaging around 115, 150,000 uh, daily viewers. And on some days on FS1, there were days they were hitting like 55,000 concurrent viewers. And that was just that was just really, really bad. So a lot of people were scared about, you know, what could happen with Skip in terms of the ratings. Some people that had disagreements with Skip in the public forum were even poking fun at that. So when we found out that he was no longer going to be on the show, a lot of people assumed that it had to do with his abysmal ratings, right? The poor ratings. But as it turns out, it seems like, in fact, it wasn't FS1 that let go of Skip Bayless. Instead, it seems it seems that based on the reporting and the information that we got for you guys today, it seems like Skip was the one that decided to leave. So let's get into what this uh, article we're reading from is from Awful Announcing. It says, Skip Bayless and says he left FS1 to escape TV handcuffs, no more bosses with huge egos. The article then continues on. For everyone who's been begging and clamoring to get more unfiltered, to get a more uh, unfiltered Skip Bayless, today appears to be your lucky day. Bayless left FS1 after nearly eight years last month, and his exit has largely been spun as a network's decision, citing Undisputed's rating entering a tailspin in the wake of Shannon Sharp's exit. But on the latest episode of the Skip Bayless show, the, the 72-year-old sports entertainer uh, attempted to spin the departure as his choice, citing freedom of expression. The NFL season is about to start along with the new life, my new life, Bayless said. I have waited a long time for this moment. I am finally free. Free to unleash in ways 
I never have. Free to give you every bit of me without boundaries or handcuffs or fear of suspension. I recently left FS1 as an exit. Uh, I recently left FS1. An exit I had planned for several months because I wanted to do this. I wanted to be my own boss, to bet on myself, to be free from the TV networks I worked for for 35 years. For 35 years, I've been told, don't, 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 careful, careful, careful. I've tiptoed, sidestepped, pulled punches. No more bosses with huge egos and hidden agendas. No more games that you have th uh, that have to be played behind closed network doors. Now I'm free to be 1,000% me. Bayless has been one of the well has been one of the well, most well-known sports media personalities for decades, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a reader, viewer, or listener who felt uh, bosses unfairly shackled him during his. Uh, career and then it says a few other things on his podcast however Bayless gave the example that if he was still with FS1 he would have been prohibited from discussing the NFL placing restrictions on Tom Brady's uh, Fox broadcasting access Bayless uh, Bayless is right FS1 would have prohibited him from discussing the Tom Brady's topic as they seemingly did with Colin Coward early this week. But in terms of network restrictions and potential things you can't talk about, the NFL barring uh, Brady from production meetings is probably low on the list. So you heard what Skip Bayless had to say. Let's unpack this quickly. First of all, he basically is dispelling all of the rumors and reports that he was fired because, again, many of us felt that the reason that the network decided to go in a different direction was solely based on the ratings. But according to what he's saying, he said that he'd been planning this for seven months. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper in his comments. He said he had been planning this for seven months. Not that he told them seven months ago that he wants to leave, which means what? He There's also a possibility that he probably looked into the future and saw that the show wasn't going to be what it used to be without Shannon Sharp. And he started to plan his next move. There's also that aspect here. I'm not saying that's the truth, but that could be a possibility. Because my understanding, and I think the understanding of many, is that the executives at FS1 are the decision, the, the, the decision makers. Right? They were the ones that decided that, look, it's time for Shannon Sharp to go in a different direction. I think they're the ones that decided that, look, this show needs a refresh, it needs a rebrand, they need to bring in new new faces and all of that. So I think it was their decision. Um, so two things could be true. It could be that Skip saw the writing on the wall and also FS1 decided to let him go. Now, everything else he said in terms of what he was looking forward to doing, in terms of his freedom, be able to say things, go in different directions without having so many constraints upon him. I think that there's some truth to that as well. I can understand it. I can see that. Obviously, on TV, you're going to have some restrictions. You got to play a role. You got to play a part. Many media personalities have said as such, have said as much. How shows are structured, especially debate shows. You got to take this side. I got to take that side. Many people have kind of broken this down into uh, uh, um, um, various pieces, right? But nevertheless, it is surprising to hear that. I mean, based on the based on the way the information came off, meaning the quotes that we read to you. It's, it, it sounds like as if this was Skip's decision. I want to quickly read what he said uh, once more. He said, I have waited a long time for this moment. I am finally free. Free to unleash in ways I never have. Then he said, I recently, hear this, left FS1, an exit I had planned for several months because I wanted to do this. If you pay attention to the wording, it it, it doesn't, it doesn't, 100% say that it was his decision. It's, it's not conclusive that it was Skip's decision to leave. What's clear is that he was planning for a departure, but it doesn't mean that the FS1 executives didn't fire him and he essentially where he essentially walked into the office and told him, I want, I'm done and I want to go, right? I don't think it was that, but... What show did we produce a day or so ago? We uh, produced a show that was centered on a, a sit down that Stephen A. Smith had on Chris Carter's new show. And during his visit 
They spoke about sports media. They talked about the business, et cetera, et cetera. But then it got to a point where Chris Carter himself, they spoke about the, the, the incident between Chris Carter and Skip Bayless. But then it got to a point during their sit down where Chris Carter himself directly, directly asked uh, Stephen A. Smith, what was the cause of the fallout uh, between yourself and Max Kellerman? He then went on to explain uh, his views. And then what happened? We produced the show. People reacted to it. And then I noticed over the past 12 to 24 hours, many different news outlets started picking up on that story. And many people started covering it, right? Many people started talking about it and saying all of these things and blah, 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 about some of the things that Stephen A. Smith said in terms of the breakup that took place between him. So, well, not the breakup, Max Kellerman basically being booted from ESPN First Take. And then I began to think, as I was kind of going through these various articles, I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, there's 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 a disturbing pattern, disturbing pattern that I'm noticing here, right? And it reared his ugly head once again during the sit down that he had with Chris Carter. Now, what am I talking about? Stephen A. Smith has this proclivity to constantly throw Max Kellerman under the, under the bus. And really where it started was during a sit down where, that he had with Joe on the Joe Budden podcast about a year or so ago. This was after Max not only had no longer been on ESPN first take, he was no longer on This Is Just In, he was no longer on ESPN The Morning Show because he was part of the cord cutting that the network had done. So he was totally out of a job at this particular moment. Then Stephen A. Smith goes on the uh, Joe Bunn podcast and essentially begins to destroy not only the reputation of Max Kellerman, but his credentials and was basically saying Max Kellerman didn't even deserve to be on ESPN given the, given the lack of credentials that he had. I want to play what he had to say for you on Joe Bunn's show because it's going to give this show more context so we want to play that for you now i want you guys to listen to what he said originally on the joe button podcast and i'm going to come back and continue on the show take a listen to Stephen a smith there what do you say to the people say they saw the tension between you and max developing on air before his departure from the show did you hear any of that i heard some of it i would tell full responsibility for that that's totally my fault okay and the reason why it was my fault because i didn't like working with him man it's just that damn simple. I didn't like it. I thought the show was stale. Um, I thought that we had flatlined when it came to the public at large. And I'm trying to win. I mean, I didn't want to go from number one to number two when Skip left. I, that's not what I wasn't having that. That sh was not going to happen. Did anything in the numbers say that, that you might have been headed that way? No, but to me it did. Creatively. It, to me it did, not just creatively, but the consistency of the numbers. Got it. In other words, it wasn't going this way. Yeah. It was just there. And so, and so that's what I was feeling. And it was like, you know, listen, I had mad respect from him from the standpoint that white dude, highly intelligent, Ivy League educated from Columbia, smart as a whip, can talk his ass off, can talk about anything. And I get all of that. But you weren't an athlete and you weren't a journalist. And the, the absence of the two components left people wondering, why should we listen to you? Okay, well, you might have had that figured out on Sports Nation, or you might have had that figured out on another show. But on this show, if you looked at the content emanating in the social stratosphere, meaning YouTube and other components that you use to measure one's cachet, uh, uh, Q ratings, focus groups, all of these different things, it was like... I was damn near doing the show by myself because we were oceans apart in terms of cachet. Well, how are you oceans apart from me if you sit right across from me five days a week for the whole two hours? Because one of us is resonating and one of us is not in that platform. And so for me, I was like, look, this is what it is. And we had a number of conversations, one-on-one, -on -one, many, many times. I know this audience. 
I know what they're looking for. I know what they need, et cetera, et cetera. At some point, you're going to do what you need to do or you don't. And if you don't do what you need to do, I'm going to get somebody who will. So you heard what he had to say. He was essentially saying that Max Kellerman was neither a journalist nor was he an athlete. And he said, so why would people even need to listen to you? Why, why should they feel the need to listen to you, right? Why should they feel the need? He then went on to say he could get a sense basically from YouTube and other places, other metrics that, that measure sentiment, that the pairing of him and Max Kellerman uh, was simply not going to work. Simply not going to work. So what happens? He goes on the Chris Carter show and Chris Carter asked him, what was the fallout? What was the reason that the show ultimately didn't work out with you and Max Kellerman? And guess what Stephen A. Smith said? The very first sentence to come out of his mouth was that the reason it didn't work out was because it was Max Kellerman's fault. That's what he said. So what we want to do now is I want you guys to listen to what he had to say on the Chris Carter show, which just took place this week, just this week. And I want to come back and give you guys our closing thoughts. Take a listen to Stephen A. Smith here. Max Kellerman. Yeah. What was the rub there? Why wasn't that show as successful as other partners that you've had in that, in that spot? Lack of chemistry. Um, believe it or not, it was more his fault than mine. Um, I've seen his friend Marcellus Wiley uh, bring up stuff. Um, Marcellus Wiley knows one side. He certainly never spoke to me about it. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, never called, mm -hmm. never asked, or anything like that. And I'm not hating on him for it because that's his man. Him and Max are very, very tight. Um, but if you want to talk about me, I'm not hard to find. Ask me. Well, we've I, had I, hundreds of conversations. That's and right. Marcellus has that's had that's hundreds that's of conversations. How about so, that? So, how about that? Yes. Yeah, so. And yeah. is one of the many yeah. brothers and sisters that this dude has helped out at ESPN because listen, when you interview with ESPN, it might be a phone interview, video interview, it might be in yeah. person. But when they when they when you leave, guess what they do? Yeah. Stephen A. Yeah. Bro, what you think? Hey, you know him? You know her? Yeah. That all the time. But but I will say this. You know, I might disagree with what he says, but there have been times when I think that Marcellus has been more than fair. And he's entitled to his opinion. I'm certainly not here uh, to criticize him. I only bring him up because when I think about Max Kellerman, I think about the narrative that he's helped put out there. Mm. And I'm like, talk to me. And you, all you had to do, because I might, I might, there's certain things I may not say publicly, but I'd have told Marcellus because I know that's his boy. Right. Um, you know, but it was a chemistry issue. And I, and I think that people need to understand it was mostly my fault. I'm the leader. I'm the executive mm. producer of the show. Mm. I'm the star of the show. I'm not looking at, I wasn't looking at Max Kellerman and saying it was his fault that the show failed. I'm talking about us. How I vibe with all the people that I vibe for. The proof is in the pudding. Look at how I vibed with the people that have been there since he's been gone. Look at how I vibed with Skip Bayless as a debate partner before he arrived. I think mm. that Max Kellerman is somebody that I'm rooting for to return to this business. Um, he's somebody that is nothing short of brilliant, like yes. genius level, yes. brilliant, absolutely true. Here's the issue for a debate show. Because you are such a genius and you are so brilliant and you have the ability to articulate yourself the way that he does, at some point in time, you're talking and you're talking and you're talking and you're talking above the audience to the point where they find themselves asking, what did you just say? Now, I might get it because I know you mm -hmm. and I know where you're going right. and I know how you feel because right. I'm working with you every day. So you heard everything that was said. I want to get I want to take my time and get into my thoughts about this. There are two things that stood out to me. Two things in particular. The first thing he was saying by saying it was Max's fault, if you pay close attention, he was essentially saying that Max Kellerman was sounding too smart for his audience. 
because if you listen to the Chris Carter clip, he said at the end of when Max would finish speaking, whatever argument he made, he said a lot of people were sitting there scratching their heads and saying, what is this guy saying? Or what did he just, what is he, what, what is he talking about? Basically, he was saying that Max, the way he would explain things and go about things was going over the head of his audience. That's number one. Number two, if you reference the Joe Bun audio, he said, if you don't do the job that it's supposed to be done or the way I want you to do the job, I will get someone else to do it the way I want and you will be gone. You will be gone in a, in a, in a, in a hot quick second. So what he's saying was, if Max was not willing to dumb down his analysis of things, the language he used, the vocabulary that he used, he was going to find someone else to bring it down a notch. And therefore, he replaced Max Kellerman and got him kicked off the show and went to an ensemble cast that he felt could perform that role better. Now, here's what's interesting. In both instances, Joe Button and Chris Carter asked him, when you say that the show wasn't working with, with Max, was it based on ratings? In both cases, he said no. So it had nothing really to do with ratings. It had something to do with a personal feeling that he had. Now, Stephen A. Smith is the A side of that relationship. We must never forget this. We must never forget that. He's the A side. He's the one that's really going to call the shots that we get that. And he certainly made that clear with his treatment of Max Kellerman on live TV pretty much every single week. We, we, we understood, right? But nevertheless... The point still stands that basically he wanted somebody or people to go up there and basically dumb people down. Number one or number two, he wanted to be that he can get other people that could dumb people down and he would be the smartest man in the room when he spoke, at least the most eloquent man. And I think he achieved that. I think he achieved that. I want to get to a larger issue that I think we need to touch on, which is this. The fact that he felt Max was speaking above the audience. I have a totally different take, not on what he was saying in terms of ESPN first take. I'm talking about sports fans in general. Okay. Because I personally believe if you withhold a standard and you're looking to cultivate an audience, ultimately, what will need to happen is that the audience is going to have to meet you at the standard that you set. If you set the bar low and you create trash and you're always just basically you're unfiltered to the point where it's like, this is craziness. You're going to track that. But if you try to set a standard for yourself, you're going to find like-minded people. They're going to meet you there. I give you, I give you guys an example. We're talking about when we were thinking about uh, creating the show has had many iterations from when we first started. But at the core of it, when we were designing the show and the type of show that we wanted to have and the type of brand that we wanted to build, myself and Marco and now Mitch and, every, you know, as, as we as we move forward, number one, I made a concerted effort to not swear, right? Not because I can't swear. I can swear with the best of them. Trust and believe I can swear with the best of them. But I didn't want to come off that way because number one, that was already in the marketplace. And I didn't think that the marketplace needed another guy doing that. Number one, you can do it occasionally, but that wasn't going to be my disposition. Number two, I made an effort. I made an effort to speak as eloquently as I could, which means that I had to read more books, continue to be a student, learn. So, so where, so, so, so therefore, whenever I'm, I'm expressing my views, they're clear for people to understand, right? That's the second thing. Third thing is we try to pre present ourselves as professionals to the best that we can, not to the point where. People feel like they can't they can't relate to you, but there has to be a certain decorum. Whenever you present yourself in a way that's thoughtful, people take notice. People are not stupid. This is the thing about it all. People aren't stupid. People can look and see the people that are putting forth the effort and they can see the people that are not. It's clear. It's clear. Right? It's clear. And we and we said to ourselves, we want to have one of the smartest sports communities on the internet. And I think we've done that. I think we've done that. If you go to our comment section, whether it's our community board, we have one of the smartest, most vibrant sports communities on the internet. I would debate this with anybody. People talk, they go back and forth, but most importantly, people don't insult each other. 
They don't swear at each other. They don't say nasty things. Of course, you have the, the rotten apples. But for the most part, people are disagreeing with one another in a respectful way. So what does this mean? It means that instead of looking for somebody to dumb down viewers, you can actually get people to elevate viewers. You can. I've seen it. It happens every single day. So I totally disagree. I don't think that Max was too smart for the audience. I don't think it was none of that. I think that if they decided that that's the type of show that they wanted to have, it could be done. Now, maybe Stephen A. Smith, not maybe. <clears throat> it is clear that that's not the type of show he wanted. It is clear. It is clear. And personally, I think all of this crazy sports talk that we have going on, yeah, it can be entertaining to a certain level, but I think some of it is getting a little bit out of hand. Some of the things that the people are saying on the internet these days is crazy, right? It's crazy for the clicks and views and how 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 uh, uh, disrespectful. I'm talking about some creators now, because they're setting the precedent for. Because if they if your viewers see, if your audience see, that's how you behave. They're going to mirror you. You're going to attract people that are just like you. So to me, I think there's a danger in that. But overall, I've noticed this pattern, which is Stephen A. Smith has this obsession with blaming Max Kellerman for everything. Just come out and say that look. You thought he was above the, you thought he was too smart for the people like that, but to blame him, blame him in a sense that he wasn't willing to play the game. Good for Max for staying true to yourself, man. Good for Max for staying true to yourself. And you're going to have people on TV saying, oh, well, you got JJ Reddick. You got JJ Reddick. He was up there insulting you and doing, maybe that's what you wanted. Because Max Kellerman would never do that to you. I've seen JJ Reddick undress your ass on TV, undress you. If that's what you wanted, I guess that's what you that's what you got. 